Uh, yeah, so I'm Richard Knievko. I'm, I'm part of the work group Analytic X-ray Physics at the Technical University. And today I will present a lab-based X-ray spectrometer. Um, here at the bottom, you can see a, a small sneak peek inside the, the vacuum chamber of the spectrometer. It is a von Hammes type spectrometer and um, we are using a graphite crystal analyzer to gain a lot of efficiency in, in the von Hammes spectroscopy. Um, before I will focus on, on the spectrometer, I want to give you a short overview uh, of, of some of the research topic in the, in the work group of analytical X-ray physics. Um, so one of the goals is to transfer synchrotron-based techniques into the laboratory. And there are a couple of topics. So on the one hand, there's X-ray microscopy in the soft X-ray range. It's a full feed microscope in the water window with the possibility to, to do cryotomography. Um, sketch of the setup is shown here. Yeah, so there's also the mental depth profiling of layer samples with nanometer resolution in the hard X-ray range with grazing incidence and grazing emission XF. Um, the setup is shown here and the dedicated uh, grazing emission setup is shown here. It's also possible to do it in a soft X-ray uh, region with the setup um, combined with a laser plasma source. Um, another topic is elemental imaging 2 and 3D with a microfocus confocus setup. This is using pulley capillary lenses and there are also cryo measurements possible. One of the setups is shown here. And um, the last part is chemical speciation, the thing we will focus on today. Um, in particular in the heart and, and tender X-ray range uh, are von Harmos type spectrometers. Um, example shown here on the, on the bottom right. And also in the soft X-ray range, X-ray absorption with reflective zone plates and also laser plasma source. For the motivation of lab-based spectroscopy, I took the graph Jerry Seidler already presented. So in this case, you see on the X-axis the capability of your instruments and on the Y-axis your axis frequency or your ease of axis. And for most methods, the relationship is given by the black curve. So there are a lot of um, introductionary spectrometers, um, but for XAS and XAS, this relationship is quite strange so that you have a lot of nice beamlines where you can do high, highly advanced uh, spectroscopy, but not much in a general purpose and introductory region. And it's more or less this region where lab-based XAS will, will be used for. Um, the problem, of course, with left left well, based XCS is that the sources you are you have available in a uh, in the lab are limited compared to synchrotron sources. Most also the spectrometer I will present is using an X-ray tube, and on the right side you can see this the comparison between the spectral brightness and often case most of the excitation comes from the characteristic lines of your X-ray tube, and uh, the intensity is oftentimes a couple of uh, orders lower compared to synchrotron sources. Therefore, it's often quite a good idea to make an efficient detection scene in the laboratory. And this is something which the spectrometer I will present to you today will, will focus on. Um, sometimes also trading efficiency for, for resolving power. Also, the spectrometer I will present today will be, will be, let's say, in the region between general purpose and, and specialized. So it's quite a complex and also expensive setup. Um, another advantage, of course, of having an efficient detection scheme is that you can better measure radio red sensitive samples. Um, of course, also, as Jerry already mentioned in his presentation in his JC, there are a lot of work groups who are developing lab-based spectrometer. And a nice overview can be found at the last in, at the publication by, by Zimmermann. Also important to mention is that generally the lab-based spectrometer do not compete with the synchrotrons and definitely do not aim to replace them, but they are rather meant to, to complement the synchrotrons. I will shortly introduce the two most common X-ray spectrometry geometries. On the left side, you have the rolling circle geometry. Here, a spherical band crystal analyzer is used, and the idea is that more or less the whole crystal surface fulfills um, or is the crystal surface fulfills the work condition only for, for a single energy and therefore selects 
part of a polychromatic source for one wavelength, which you then measure with, with high efficiency and you scan your setup to get your whole spectrum. In the Van Hamer's geometry, you only have a linear band crystal analyzer. Here, the crystal surface um, fulfills the back condition for a whole range of energies, um, but each energy is only reflected on a small crystal section. Um, the idea uh, of the setup we are using, which is in Van Hamer's geometry, is to use a crystal, which increases the, the crystal section that takes part in a reflection of a single energy, and thereby increasing the, the efficiency. Also, what, what can say you, you can ditch the crystal analyzer part and use an energy dispersive pixelated detector directly. An example was given by, by Casey Morgan, also in the Stray C series, where transition attenders is used. Okay, let me come to the to the crystal we are using. It's it's called highly annealed pyrolytic graphite, in short HAPG. It's produced by the company OptiGraph, and so the increase in efficiency can be seen on the bottom right side. There you can see um, the angle range where the crystal reflects um, intensity um, here compared with a silicon one one crystal, and uh, well the angle range is greatly increased for the HAPG crystal, which uh, corresponding increase in efficiency. So how is this possible, or how is it done? The, so it's a graphite crystal, but, but not a perfect crystal, but there's small interlayer, de interlayer defects in the crystal, which create um, independently scattering domains, which, which are called crystallites. These are assumed to be perfect crystals, and they make up the mosaic crystal. These small crystallites all have a small angle deviation for the crystal surface, which can be well described by a two-dimensional crossing distribution. And the typical width is 0 0.06 degrees. And due to the small angle deviation for the surface, well, the, the angle range where the crystal can reflect one, one single wavelength is correspondingly increased. These crystals normally come as thin flexible sheets, in normally between 20 and 100 micrometers for, for high-resolution spectroscopy. And they are then applied to a glass surface. So an example can be seen here. This, this is the HAPG crystal and below is the, is the glass surface. Um, since it's, it's highly flexible, of course, even more demanding uh, geometries can be realized than, than just a, a cylinder segment. Um, a nice example is, is given by the manufacturer where, where a small bunny is, is put with this graphite crystal. Um, when we some two important facts about the HGBG crystal, which will also be of interest later, is that the mean crystallite thickness is quite small with around three micrometers, uh, which normally means that the intrinsic reflection width of this crystallite is bigger than for, for perfect silicon crystals. And um, the used crystal cut 002, which is used for, for spectroscopy in first order, um, has a despacing of around uh, 0.354 nanometers, which is quite close to the silicon one one crystal and gives you more or less the lowest energy you can detect of around 2 kV, which is also the lowest energy the, the spectrometer will present, uh, can measure. All right, that was, uh, uh, thank you for the introduction, that's fascinating. Um, uh, what a, uh, so when comparing the silicon and the HAPG, you showed that there was the broader rocking curve response. Um, when you're designing these spectrometers, does the better, does the deeper penetration of x-rays into the graphite instead of the silicon also play a role? Um, sure, it, it plays, plays of course a major role. We will later look at efficiency and resolving power. Oh, okay. And of course, when you penetrate deeper into the crystal, so you have, so the problem is you want, um, as is often the case, you want efficiency, uh, so highest efficiency and the highest resolving power, which uh, normally doesn't go well together. And for this spectrometer, um, the crystal is relatively thin to, to, to give you a good resolving power with 20 micrometer thickness uh, of the crystallite. But this will mean since the penetration, so X-rays penetrate this crystal much better compared to perfect silicon crystals. Therefore, for higher energies, um, some or depending on energy, a lot of, of intensity is not scattered by the crystal itself. And it will of course also introduce broadening, additional broadening not present in, in the silicon crystal. 
see. I see. Uh, a second question. I know in the plasma physics community, when they use um, a graphite, they'll they'll sometimes use the zero zero four reflection. Um, I'm yes. just wondering if that's something that you've considered. Um, yes, but good that you mentioned it. So we are using the zero zero two since it's the um, it's much more efficient. So the zero zero four is is the next uh, higher allowed order. So the second second reflection order and um, the price you pay is um, an increase in intensity by around a factor of 10. So it is possible. Um, we, we also me measured in this um, in the second or even third order. But again, in result resolution is not so high um, compared to the um, well, to the efficiency you lose. Okay, very good. Okay, I'll remind everyone to please put their questions in the chat and you should continue, Richard. Okay, so um, so we already tried to increase the efficiency of the spectrometer by, by using a different type of crystal. And we also try to increase the efficiency by using um, a different geometry. So first let me start with the classic von Harmus geometry. So in this case, source and detector on the crystal axis, you have a small cylinder segment which is your diffracting crystal and the detector is parallel to the crystal axis. And the common way to increase then the solid angle and therefore also the efficiency of your detector or spectrometer is to, to use multiple crystals. An example is shown on the right side, um, in this case for four possible crystals. The geometry or the method developed in, in our work group is to use, instead of a small cylinder segment, uh, the full cylinder. This is possible since the HABG crystal is it's really flexible, you can just apply it to, to your surface, uh, to your substrate. Um, an example is shown here on the right side. So you, see, you can see here the full cylinder um, glass substrate where the HABG crystal is applied on. And um, what you have to consider is how to, where to put your detector. So you can no longer put the detector parallel to the crystal axis. Um, but now on the next slide, you can see it, you have to put it uh, perpendicular to the, to the crystal axis, so it can detect radiation from, from the whole 330 degrees of the full cylinder. So this, this is a sketch of the setup. You only can see the, the top and bottom part of the crystal, um, but it's, it's a full cylinder. Here is the sample position. Um, the sample is normally or typically in 45 degree angle between crystal axis and incident radiation. And what you now get is, with your detector perpendicular to the crystal axis is your energies are mapped uh, on the detector as circles. And the specific radius has a specific energy. There are uh, multiple possibilities to position the detector. So some are good, some are bad. So in position A, um, all the radiation you detect simultaneously, it's the detector before it intersects the crystal axis. We call this the pre-focus position. And in this case, the lower radius means lower energy and then higher radius, higher energy. In position B, the thing is, is flipped, um, but also a good measuring position. Uh, measuring in position C is not advised since in this case, there is no, um, the energy to radius relation is not, so the energy switches a lot by um, scanning through the, uh, through the radii. And therefore you should measure either your whole spectrum in the pre-focus position, this would be this position or in the post-focus position. On the right side, you can see a typical intensity distribution on the detector. Um, here we can identify two rings, therefore more or less two main energies. And to get your energy spectrum, you first have to find the center position of the circles, marked here as an X. And afterwards, you sum all intensity in one radius channel, which the width of the radius channel is normally given by the pixel size. And you do this for all, for already, and then you get your, your spectrum still in uh, radius. Um, and at the last step, you just have to convert the radius to an energy, and then you get, get your spectrum. In this case, it's just a couple K alpha spectrum. Something which, which is to mention is that the energy axis by a sample change is quite, quite stable. So of course you don't scan your uh, components, so they are fixed. And also the center position of the circle is a really good indicator of, of your sample 
um, position in, in space. Therefore, it's quite easy to reproduce for, um, for new samples the, the sample position you had with your last sample. And you therefore get quite a stable energy axis. So right now, there are three full cylinder van Hammer spectrometers in the world uh, on the top left is the first of its kind developed in, in our research, uh, in research group. Um, the second spectrometer is located at the PTB at BC2, um, developed in the research group of X-ray spectrometry. And the third one is located at the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Energy Conversion, which was developed in cooperation with us in the research group of inorganic spectroscopy. And it is this spectrometer I will, I will focus, focus on from now on. You can see a sketch of the spectrometer setup. So the, the CCD camera, the crystal and the sample, which is the red circle, um, are all located into a, in, into a vacuum chamber, which is around 3.5 meters long. The CCD is back illuminated, normally cooled down to minus 50 degrees Celsius. It has around 40 micrometer and active layers, an inch by an inch, and is typically operated in single photon counting mode to increase the signal to noise ratio. The heart of the spectrometer is, is the Swiss in the HAPG crystal you, you already saw. This has a diameter of 600 millimeter, 20 micrometer thick HAPG crystal, which is 20 millimeters long. Both the detector and the crystal can be moved um, inside the vacuum chamber to, to change the energy. Typically, the energy bandwidth you can uh, measure simultaneously with the setup is given either by the length of this crystal or the size of the detector and for almost all energies this is sufficient to, to measure the, the interesting region for, for XAS. It is of course um, quite easily possible to extend uh, energy bandwidth for the crystal you just have to make it longer. So as an example we are right now developing a spectrometer where over one kilo electron volts is detected simultaneously, this, but this is an absorption spectrometer. Um, increasing the detector energy bandwidth is of course a bit uh, trickier since you need a bigger and bigger and bigger detector. Um, just not so easy to come by. Okay, so um, as, I, as I mentioned, the sample is also located in, inside the vacuum chamber. Um, there are two main reasons. The one reason is to reduce absorption since we want to measure down to 2 keV. And the other reason is to be able to measure air or moisture, moisture, uh, moisture sensitive samples. Um, for that reason, there's also a glove box which is integrated into the, to the spectrometer where you can um, put your sample into the vacuum chamber through the load lock system. And uh, your, your sample has, does, does not have to see uh, ambient air ever. Um, the sample is mounted on the helium cryo cooler, mostly used to reduce radiation damage. Okay, the, so the last piece, how, how to get, of course, a nice photon flux on the detector is to use a, a good source. In this case, a gallium metal jet um, is used with 250 watts power, operated at 70 keV. Um, the spectrum, the typical spectrum of the gallium jet is shown on the right. So the black curve is supplied by the manufacturer and the red dotted line, well, I, I put there just to indicate how the Bremsstrahlung spectrum normally behaves. This is not accurate, um, just, just uh, as a side information. And for the spectrometer, most of the excitation comes from the gallium K lines um, centered around 10 keV. Um, the Bremsstrahlung spectrum is um, not so important for, for the excitation of the, of the samples. Um, at the last piece, we, we are using a polycapy lens full lens, uh, 570 millimeter lens, to focus the radiation from the source onto the sample in a, in a small spot, which is important to, to get good resolving power. There's, so the energy range of the spectrometer is 2 to 10 keV at least in, in first order of reflection. So the 2 kV is, is given by the despacing of the crystal and the higher energy range is given by, by the length of the vacuum vessel. And also the whole spectrometer was designed to be operated in this, in this energy range. Since we are using 
um, a gallium gallium containing source. Um, the, the excitation is with the K lines is highly efficient for for these for the three D elements. Um, it is of course possible to go to higher orders, so this would be the 004 or 006 cut. Um, but in this case, you lose a lot of efficiency because you cannot uh, excite elements around uh, over 11 kV with the gallium K lines. Um, you, therefore, you only have the Bremsstrahlung. Also, the detector loses a lot of efficiency and uh, the crystal also. So it is in principle possible to, to measure high reflection orders. It's, it's only possible with um, highly reduced efficiency. For the airlines, what the airlines you can measure are, are indicated in purple also for the first reflection order. Thank you, Richard. Um, a few questions. First, a technical question. Um, the gallium jet, you said it's operated at 70 kilovolts? Yes. Um, but wouldn't you get, um, uh, sorry, with a, a thicker anode, I don't know much about the gallium jet, you would typically try to decrease the kilovoltage and it would push more of the intensity down to lower energies? Is that not an option with the gallium jet? Um, not really. So it is an option to reduce the high voltage, but um, with reduced power, more or less correspondingly reduced power since I guess oh, the... Oh, I see. So I think not much more current can be supplied by the, or can be put on the okay. anode. I see, I see. That's how so yes, it's, it's, it's sad. It would be really nice, of course, to go to, <laughs> to lower excitation voltages. Definitely. Um, uh, I guess a, a comment is that the um, M fluorescence lines for the, uh, the actinides, of course, are in this energy range also, yes? Um, sure. Yeah, two, yeah, three, yeah. five, yeah. And there's a, a lot of interest in those at synchrotrons, though admittedly mostly in the, um, uh, in the RICs. Um, uh, just a, 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 a last question, and I'm encouraging people to please type their questions into the chat. And is, maybe I um, can, oh, sorry. How is, oh, go ahead, sorry. I, I just, of course you can, can measure yeah, the M lines with, with the same efficiency, of course, just yes. while the cross-section is reduced for this. Yes. Um, uh, your detector, how, uh, um, uh, often when you make a spectrometer that uses a large area on a detector, you have to worry about backgrounds. Um, what yes. can you tell us about dark current and stray scatter? Um, normally not, not really of major concern, so it depends. So as, as I told you, um, so it, an advantage of has a, having not a, a, the brightest source is that um, the photon density on your detector per second is, for at least for, for k-beta or valence to core measurements, not so high, which means you can operate your CCD detector in, in photon counting mode, meaning you have spatially, I'm, I'm not sure how far, how, how, as I prepared some slides, I'm not sure if I should show them. Uh, if um, you uh, uh, want to take a minute, sure. Okay, so when you measure, um, K-beta or valence to core spectra, also for diluted samples, um, and, your, and you integrate, let's say, a second or three seconds, uh, it can be that um, only single photon counting events are on your detector, um, shown, ex shown here as an example. Um, and then you can, of course, start to evaluate these single, single photon hits. Um, you know there is a linear um, connection between energy and uh, create a charge inside the detector and therefore you you can get an energy dispersal spectrum with your CCD camera shown shown here. Um, so you see, of course, there's a lot of, so I, mm, let me see this, it looks like a 5.5. <laughs> uh, so this seems to be a chrome measurement. And uh, so this would be um, the intensity you're most interested in, and, and all the rest is intensity you don't want. And uh, by, by operating the CCD camera and seeing photon counting mode, you can, um, well, take a right of this, this range, and then um, only use this intensity, which is the detector, and therefore greatly reduced. So um, dark current is of no concern in this, in this region, because all the dark, dark current would be in the, in the low energy region. Um, since 
the intensity for a single chrome uh, heat would be much higher. And scattered radiation from the chamber walls um, or from, from different compounds in, inside your sample uh, can be mostly get rid of in, in this way. Yeah, and this is mostly done with the spectrometer and therefore you can get quite nice, almost noise-free spectra. And you're only limited by the signature noise, uh, the, the photon statistics. So an example is, it's, it's quite nice. So <laughs> on the left side, you see the CCD image um, just integrated, let's say uh, 10 minutes. And uh, you can of course also do this by um, taking only three to uh, two to three seconds exposure times with the same integration time. And then you apply your uh, single photon counting. And then you can, as you can see, you, you greatly increase your signature noise ratio, which can also be seen in the, um, in the spectrum. In this case, I think it's a alpha, uh, chi alpha measurement. So the, oh, sorry. so the answer is yes, it's, it's normally of major concern, but uh, measuring in, in single photon counting gets, get, gets rid of most of these effects. I also have to mention, this is really a common approach uh, with lab-based uh, spectrometers. So I guess Jerry's um, spectrometer is using using the same thing, maybe a different algorithm. Also the, the group in Poland is, is using also a single photon counting evaluation. So it's, it's quite typical and it's really useful. Okay, thank you. You should, uh, uh, you should continue to the third part of your talk then. Sure. Um, okay, now I want to focus on energy resolution and efficiency of the spectrometer. And at first we, we look at more of the focus, focusing properties of the HAPG crystal. Um, so the ideal case would be um, the, small, the small crystallites are only located on the Roland circle and one energy is reflected over the whole crystal length and uh, focused in, in one spot. Uh, in reality, of course, um, there are a couple of broadening mechanisms so on the one hand, this, this was the question before, is of course a uh, broadening introduced by the, by the mosaicity of the crystal. So reflection is also happening on crystallites which are not uh, located on the wallet circle and therefore um, the radiation hits the detector on, on different parts or positions. Um, this is unique to, to a mosaic crystal and not present in, in, in most perfect crystals. Um, but of course, there's also the broadening introduced by the source size and, and the intrinsic broadening as I already mentioned, since the crystallites are quite thin, this intrinsic broadening is normally higher for mosaic crystals, at least for the, for the higher energy region. So this gives us more or less for the presented HAPG spectrometer located at the Planck Institute for Chemical Energy Conversion, a constant resolving power of around 4,000 for the working energy range of the spectrometer from 2 to 10 kV, at least in, in first order. Um, this means a broadening of around 0 0.5 eV in, in really the lowest energy range, which is possible, which is quite a good value. And um, then you go to, for copper K alpha, you go to a broadening of around 2 eV. So the reason why the resolution for, for the higher energies is not so good is that for high energies, um, all the energy broadening mechanisms I introduced in the slide before have almost the same um, width and, and therefore the, the resolving power is, is, is decreased accordingly. Since in the lower energy range, the broadening is really dominated by the intrinsic defection width and uh, therefore better. The broadening can be adjusted by changing the spectrum meter setup. So of course, increasing the crystal bending radius would, would give you a better energy resolution, at least for high energies. And using a thinner crystal would normally also give you a better energy resolution, but uh, bigger crystal bending radius would give you an even bigger set, a setup and smaller uh, thinner crystals less efficiency. So as I said, it's always a trade-off. And also, so for the low energy range, um, changing the spectral parameters would not change anything since you are limited by the defection width. Um, but for the high energies, so let's say 6 or 8 kV, you could uh, tune your spectrometer to let's maybe five or 6,000 in resolving power. Um, so comparing spectra, which are taken with an HAPG crystal and comparing it to, to spectra taken by, by perfect crystal spectrometers. So I'm, I'm using iron sulfide. 
um, on the left side you see a spectra taken with an HLPG crystal. The rotting is around 1.8 dB. And on the right side, um, this was done with a spherical band crystal analyzer, germanium 440, with at ID 26 with a width or the broadening of around uh, 0 0.7 EV. And of course, the broadening can be seen for the K beta prime and also at a higher energy range. But still, you get quite a nice spectrum. It, it of course, highly depends what you want to see in the spectrum, also if it's useful to you. For the lower energy, I already told you that the energy resolution is quite comparable. Um, so on the left side, the HABG crystal, on the right side, um, for, for also for a spherical band. Oh no, I'm not sure. So this is the Johansson geometry, this is the tender X-ray spectrometer um, from the publication of Rovetsi, also discussed by Peter Glatze in this JC series. Um, so meaning for low energies, uh, quite, quite a good resolution. Okay, I, I talked a lot about efficiency and uh, at first I want to compare the efficiency of an HABG based uh, von Harmos spectrometer compared to a spectrometer which would use a silicon 111 crystal. Um, so I assume they are both in von Harmos geometry and they also have the same bending radius. And then their difference in efficiency is given by the difference in integral reflectivity and also the solid angle of the package. You, you already saw this graph um, and here you can see that the, the integral reflectivity, so the area under the curve for an HABG crystal is highly increased and, and this turns out directly also in a corresponding increase in efficiency. And the second part is, has to do with, uh, so uh, what's the ratio of the opening angles of the optics? Um, we are using a full cylinder optic and so if we only would have a um, cylinder segment here shown in, shown in black, then let's say we have roughly a six times higher efficiency for the full cylinder optic. Um, as I already mentioned in the introduction, a common way to increase uh, this, the, the solid angle is of course, of course to use multiple crystals. Comparing the efficiency to the spherical band crystal analyzers is more difficult and I think it's, it's best illustrated by using an example. So for the circuit band crystal analyzer, I will be using the values from, from the publication from Zokawas. Here an excitation of 10 to the 13 photons per second was used at 7, 7 kV on a manganese oxide sample. Um, so I will compare only the efficiency of a single silicon for four core crystal. Of course, normally these spectrometers have, have uh, more than one crystal. Uh, it's in Johann geometry with a radius of 1,000 1, millimeter and a solid angle of 8 times 10 to the minus 3 uh, steradiant. And um, well, this is the HABG crystal um, from the, uh, the CEC setup. So the energy channel bits, which, so the, the energy bits you detect um, with, this, with this crystal is around 0.65 EV given by the energy resolution of the spectrometer and the stated detected photons in the manganese k beta peak are around 10 to the 6 photons. When I calculate the photons which the HABG crystal would detect with, with the same excitation, um, also in the 0.65 EV um, channel um, on the manganese k beta peak, so this includes also the broadening or the higher broadening of this HABG crystal to arrive at roughly the same magnitude. So that means that efficiency uh, for both spectrometers for, for this energy channel is comparable. Um, this is a rough uh, comparison. And uh, so the efficiency difference, of course, then depends on the number of steps you have to scan with your Johann uh, geometry since you measure a whole spectrum with the von Harms spectrometer. Um, the, the way we like to state for, for the efficiency of the, of the detector is the effective solid angle which is energy dependent on between one to five millisteriard. And this value you get when you make, uh, take the product of the solid angle of your, uh, of your crystal and multiply it with the integral reflectivity. Um, also included are all absorption effects and also the detector efficiency. So what, it, what does this value really give you? So when you have in, typically in XCS, your sample radiates um, radiation isotropically in, in 4P stereo at the end. So, and from these four P steroidians, which the sample emits, you just collect one to five millisteroidians. 
so it's quite easy to to get a good estimate how how much photons you can you can measure with the setup to give you something more concrete um, i calculated the detected photons you can expect in the k beta main lens for for solid samples and this is so for the whole k beta main lens since since we are for harmless symmetry and you measure the whole k beta uh, simultaneously these are around 2000 photons for the for phosphorus um, 7,000 for, for calcium and 16,000 photons for, for copper. Um, although the efficiency of the of the optic is, is higher for lower energies, um, of course, to get to these photon values, you also have to in, include the spectrum of your source. And this is the, the gallium source. So the, the photo uh, production cross sections, of course, uh, much higher for, for copper than for phosphorus. And therefore, you have you detect more counts for copper, although the efficiency of the of the crystal itself uh, is lower. So I would say the efficiency is more than sufficient to measure the k-beta lines and also values to core regions and uh, within limits also for diluted samples. For So an example for diluted samples is, is given here. It's a calcium speciation um, valence to core measurements. So these, these measurements were done by Zachary Martin. And he also supplied the DFT measurements, uh, calculations. The spectras are for, for seven calcium salts and also for three mimics of the oxygen, oxygen involving complex, which is important uh, for the water splitting. These, these are quite, quite diluted samples shown here on the right. And the question was, uh, can calcium valence to core well, be used as a sensitive probe uh, for, these, for these kind of samples? And I think the um, the answer is yes. At least this is the, the answer Zachary gave. Um, so yes, calcium balance to core can be used as sensitive for, for calcium coordination and it's also quite sensitive to small chemical changes. And this could be quite nicely shown with the, with the spectrometer. The measuring time of course was, at least for the diluted samples, quite high uh, with over 130 hours. Um, but of course possible with laboratory setups. Um, still, of course, uh, at the end, Zachary wished for more efficiency and also better reserving power. So uh, I think his next step would also be to, to go to the simple tool. Um, so to, to summarize, I think uh, I showed that the chemical speciation can be, can be nicely done with laboratory XAS spectrometers. I showed it for an energy range between 2 and 10 kV. Um, so the, the shown spectrometer located at the Max Planck Institute has the efficiency and depending on your questions also the resolving power to measure the valence to cost spectra for diluted samples. You can also tune your spectrometer concepts to your need, of course, with, within reasonable limits. Um, also, as, as motivated before, the laboratory XAS can be used for independent research, but of course also to, to prepare for beam times. And I, I also um, want to emphasize that this, this whole spectrometer concept is quite competitive in a lower energy range, so from 2 to 3 keV, since the energy resolution is quite comparable to normal perfect crystal analysis, but it should offer an increased efficiency, which may be of interest also for some crystal facilities. And so I'd like to conclude that um, laboratory XS has definitely reached a state where they can be used routinely, also for a wide variety, uh, variety of samples. And this is, of course, not only true for the spectrometer I present today, but, but uh, for the whole range of laboratory-based XAS spectrometers, um, which are available today. So I would like to, to thank um, the people from the EU, which are Wolfgang Meitzer, Daniel Grötsch, Sven Uwe Oban, Christopher Schlesinger and Birgit Kangieser from the group at the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Energy Conversion. These are Zachary Marte, Yvonne Brandburger, Christian Feig, Fabian Struck and Sivina Dubert, and also the manufacturers of the crystals, Ina Grigorviova and Alexander Antonov. And this was, now I'm finished. Very good, that's excellent. Um, as people uh, uh, put in their questions, let's see. Uh, Yulia, would you like to ask your question? 
have to remove my headsets. Uh, so thank you very much for this nice uh, talk. Uh, so I have a question on uh, practicality limits uh, for concentration. Let's say uh, if I have a sulfur sample and at synchrotron once we did some, you know, sulfur in the protein, which would be maximum one millimolar concentration. Uh, so what would be the limit of sulfur concentration where it is still practical to use this setup? It's, so it's of course always difficult to answer. So you, you want to measure the K-alpha or the K-beta. So, um, so what I tried to, to do, I, I gave you um, the photon so the detected photons per second, you can expect in your K-beta mainland for a solid sample. And, and knowing that, you, you, I think you could quite easily um, calculate how many photons you would detect with your samples. You just need some, some type of physical model um, to, to also include self-absorption in the sample. And then you get a correct answer since I'm... So this is for solid samples. When you have highly diluted samples, um, of course, this, this count number will go down quite drastically. And to, yeah, well, therefore you will maybe end up with 10 or 100 photos per second, and then you can, can measure for a long time. It's, so um, I think, so we are able to, to calculate the expected photons quite accurately. So to give you a really good example, um, send me an email. I will calculate the expected um, or the detected photons and then then we can talk further, I guess. Otherwise, it's quite difficult to answer. Yeah, yeah. But have you tried anything but 100% uh, concentrated samples for sulfur? No. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll say that I suspect that they could do it, uh, Yulia. I think they have roughly 10 times the count rate of the little little sulfur instrument in my lab, and we're able to do um, sulfur K alpha at um, uh, 100 parts per million in cement, which is pretty absorbing. So I suspect that their higher efficiency would let them get K-beta under similarly challenging conditions. Um, I'll be very curious how your discussion proceeds. That'd be very interesting, a very interesting capability. Um, but I, uh, sorry, but I maybe also, of course, have to mention, so the capability to measure, measure down to, to phosphorus or, or sulfur is only possible with the spectrometer located at the Max Planck Institute. And I'm not, uh, I cannot give you beam time there, of course. <laughs> I can um, calculate how many uh, of the detected photon flux would be on the detector, but then you would have to contact Serena de Beer. Um, the spectrometer um, located at the Technical University, there the sample is not in vacuum. And we have a beryllium window between sample and the vacuum chamber. And the opening angle is not big enough um, which to allow to measure cipher. Okay, um, so you've, you've uh, it's interesting. I mean, we know that the, um, in the same way as the saying the punishment has to fit the crime, the spectrometer has to fit the, uh, uh, the final application. And in the instrument that you showed, the final application was to have a very wide energy range available for the user. What might you have done differently if the user said, I just want to study light transition elements, let's say just five to seven kilovolts. Would that have given you any extra degrees of freedom where you could have, uh, you might have done things differently? Um, I think your question is not specific enough in, in the sense that, um, so of course, when you want to, so as I motivated, uh, most of the excitation comes from the characteristic line. So of course you need a source which is uh, closest with the correct lines to the elements you want to measure. And on the other hand, um, it's relatively easy to trade efficiency with resolving power with the spectrometer type. So when you know what, um, how many, so what's your resolving power needs to be, um, then, you, then you construct your spectrometer in a way that this goal is reached and then this, the rest is used to, in, to maximize efficiency. Um, or the other way around, of course, you can try to maximize efficiency. And, and so, um, so I guess for mainly I was curious, might you have gone to a different, um, uh, might you have tried to go to something which was in, in between von Hamos and Roland to try to uh, concentrate the efficiency into a narrow energy range? Mm, I'm not sure I understand the question. So how should the geometry look like? I'm sorry, say again? 
Uh, you mean to the hybrid between Roland circle and von Hamer's geometry? I'm not. Ah, oh, okay. You okay? I, mm -hmm. It's something to think about. I mean, one application that I think would be mm -hmm. fascinating is um, uh, chromium fluorescence at uh, at part per for uh, materials at part per million levels. And um, so that would require uh, possibly just the K-alpha, but the K-beta might be more informative. And just the ability to do that with the absolute highest efficiency, I think could have some interesting environmental, uh, environmental and maybe regulatory applications. So that was what was in the back of my mind when I asked, uh, when I asked the question. Okay, no I, uh, no, I understand. And yes, I'm, I'm sure. So if you, if you're really interested only in a really small energy range, then, then of course it's, it's uh, better to to use a optic which really more or less fulfills the the right condition for this this energy yeah. region. Um, okay. Yes, this this could be I guess easily be done. Um, so we have the possibility um, to calculate quite accurately um, the the scattering behavior of the HVG crystal. And I think there's also a project right now for um, for for a daisy beamline where we construct optics uh, for for focusing. And for dispersing. I see. I see. Very good. Uh, last question, unless uh, someone else puts one in. Um, have you? Uh, uh, has your group uh, wondered about trying to push the energy range a little bit lower, going away from graphite to one of the large despacing materials? And uh, it's just the um, the the four D, the L edges for the four Ds. And uh, there's a lot of interesting fluorescence lines around one to two kilovolts. And, uh, and almost no synchrotrons measure them and almost no or maybe no lab instruments measure them. And so it's something I'm very curious about and you guys are already in vacuum. And so it, uh, it makes me wonder. No, we did not. Um, okay. I think of course there is, is a nice publication where uh, more exotic crystal with high dispersing was used with really good results, um, but we did not uh, look into it. So of course we are coming from the other direction with the uh, laser produced plasma source, which of course can oh, yes, yes. can go from let's say the the setup we have now is quite comfortable at one kV, and um, using a different type of, of laser it would also be possible to to get good excitation at let's say one point five, maybe even two kV, and that's an XAS instrument, doesn't it? Not XES. No, no, no. Yeah, this is an X. I mean, for 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 a source, of course, you need also the efficient excitation. Um, I'm so yeah. Efficient optics are, are of course then hard to come by since the reflective zone plates used in the setup are quite so the solid angle of detection is I think three magnitudes lower compared to the to the presented HFPG crystal. I see. 